Hi, I'm Mike Holt with MikeHolt.com, and we got a pretty special program. This is a video that there are probably only two videos. This is number two of the videos that I would suggest that everybody should watch. The number one video is you go to MikeHolt.tv, you go to Grounding and Bonding, and you watch Electrical Fundamentals. That's going to set the stage for everything. The second video is going to be this video we're going to create right now. And if we take a look at this slide, it's understanding the utility neutral to earth voltage. It's also known as stray voltage. So we're going to kind of tie them both together. First thing I want to do is take a moment to thank God uh, for the opportunity to be able to serve you guys and to make a difference in the lives of so many people. I get so many emails and compliments. Uh, and I just, it encouraged me to continue doing all I can to help you guys and ladies, of course. Are you ready? I said, it's a big video. It's a number two. Number one is electrical fundamentals. It's really important. This is the number two. Why do you need to understand NEV? What the heck is NEV? If we go back to the title, NEV is neutral to earth voltage. So let's start taking a look at some of the graphics and let's get into it. Well, the reason you need to know NEV is to make something safe. See, if we follow the code, and we make sure everything is installed according to the code, then what should happen is when systems fail, according to Eric Stromberg, the National Electric Code makes sure the systems fail so that it's gonna be in a safe mode, so it'll protect you. That's great, but the problem is how do we know if something is safe? How do we know if a pool is safe? How do we know if a, if a boat docks, people are in boat docks and boat lifts? What about people in RVs? in marinas, light poles, people are getting killed all the time. So how do you go and you find out whether it's going to be safe? This is the answer right here. Take a look at this young boy. He was in an RV park and he died. He was, I think he was with his grandparents and he just went out there and he touched the coach or the travel, you know, travel trailer, whatever it was he had, and he died. What's up? This is a problem. This young boy right here in Georgia climbs over a fence, just playing football, climbs over a fence to go get a football, and he dies. We're going to talk about all these cases in a short version here. Young girl jumps into a swimming, jumps in a marina, and she gets killed. This young girl in North Carolina, uh, she, she was the lifeguard, first day on the job, she gets killed. And here's the problem. Those of you who are watching, this video is designed for the electrical professional, the person who understands the National Electric Code, the person who understands electrical theory. If you don't understand electrical theory, then, we, then you need to get my, my electrical theory library. If you don't understand the code, then you need to get my library on the code. Because I'm going to be moving very, very quickly here, assuming you have that fundamental. I, I can't be teaching you all the codes and the fundamentals and the basics. So now, let's say you have the fundamentals, you know the code, you're a licensed electrician, you're a mass electrician. Somebody calls you up and let's go back and let's say on a boat dock. And I said, hey, uh, somebody got killed. Can you tell me what happened? I'm pretty sure you're not gonna be able to figure it out initially. Or not, not when somebody gets killed. If somebody gets killed, you're gonna spend all the time. You're gonna figure that out. What about if you go to a boat dock? What about if you go to a boat lift? What about at RV park? What about if you're gonna be in a swim pool? And they said, hey, could you check it and make sure it's safe? Well, that's going to be a pretty challenging thing, and this is what this program's about. All right, ready to go? The number one thing to understand NEV is understanding the electric utility distribution system. So let's just go really quick. Number one, there's going to be a power plant, generating plant. Now, I don't know. Every generating plant, I'm sure, has their own standards. It's built to the National Electric Safety Code, which is not the National Electrical Code, and they design whatever they're going to design. There is going to be a generator, and it's going to be producing, and of course, it's going to be producing voltage. That voltage can be pretty low in relationship to transmission voltage. It might be, let's say, 13,800 volts. And then there are going to be transformers, and it's going to step that voltage up from the generating facility, set up to, I don't know, half a million volts, a hundred and something thousand volts, 69,000 volts. I think they, they even, I think you guys can do some research and give us some feedback as we go along here. I think the maximum voltage might be a million volts, but I think when they start getting over 750,000 volts, they transferred from the AC circuit, they actually transmit in DC. But it doesn't really matter. Generating plant, high voltage power lines, right? Tesla, right? Tesla worked with Westinghouse to prove that if you can transform voltages to higher voltages, 
from lower voltage, you can transmit them at higher voltages, lower losses of energy, lower voltage drop, great savings, smaller conductors, just a lot of good advantages. And then the transmission lines, you can bring the high voltage transmission lines and you're gonna bring it over to a step-down distribution system. So you have a step-down substation, which you're gonna drop it down to, I don't know, 4,000, 4160, 34, it's gonna step it down. Then you go from the substation, drive around, you'll see substations all over the place. Here's an example of a substation. I don't know what the primary voltage coming in here, and I don't know what the secondary voltage coming in here, but this is bringing high voltage down to distribution voltage where you start seeing the three wires going along and maybe with the neutral power lines, but they're smaller poles, right? They're on the side of the highway. Now. We need to understand something about the utility distribution system. We have to understand the utility multi-point grounded neutral system. If you want to go on the internet and search for multi-point grounded neutral system, you're going to get all kinds of information. And I'm going to give you some resources where you can kind of do some more research if you want to understand more about the NEV. All right, so now let's just talk conceptually. Ready for this? Remember that substation I showed you in a picture? Let's just imagine this is a substation. And I'm not gonna show you three phases coming in and three phases going out. I'm just gonna show you one of the three phases. And I don't know what the primary voltage is and it's not important. What matters is, let's say the secondary was 7,200 volts. So you'll see a, a transformer pad, you'll see a, a transformer up on a pole. More than likely on the side of the transformer, it'll give you the KBA rating and might even give you the voltage like 7.2 and 25K or something like that, KBA. So let's just assume that this is 7.2 secondary. Electrons leave the secondary or the pole, right, or the, or the pad. They trap, I'm sorry, this is the substation. I'm sorry, here's the substation. That's your substation, 7200. Goes over to the transformer, I'm sorry, at the pole or the pad. Primary is 7200 volts. And then it transforms it down to, let's make it simple, 12240. Okay, because it's going to be a single phase transformer, giving you single phase voltages for the concept that we're working from. That means that the utility has two wires going out. Watch current leaves the transformer on the substation, travels down, goes to the primary of the transformer, and then it returns back. That's called electrical circuit. You all know that. But here's what's interesting about the multipoint ground and neutral system is that at the substation, they're going to ground that neutral point and they're going to connect it to the earth. Actually, it's a big substation grid and all kinds of sophisticated. That has to comply with IEEE standard 80, which of course we're not getting into. Then if you take a look at the transformer on the pole, can't see it in the pad, you'll see that they'll take one of those conductors and they're connected to the earth. So you'll see that. Then, but in between the substation and the transformer up on the pole or the transformer on the ground, between those two points, the utility, and I can't remember exactly what it is, I think there is five ground connections from the primary, from this neutral conductor right here. I think the National Electric Safety Code requires five connections of that neutral conductor to the earth minimum per mile. That means the neutral is multi-point grounded. Like, okay, well, why is that? <clears throat> By the way, if there's any guide wires, that neutral will be connected to the guide wire, which will be grounded. If there's any transformers, it's going to be grounded. If there's any capacitors, it's going to be grounded. If you see light poles and, and light fixtures on it, more than likely it's going to be grounded. So there are gonna be a minimum of five ground connection points, if I'm correct about the National Safety Code, to the earth per mile. <clears throat> now, the reason the utility multi-points grounds are neutral I'm not gonna get into right now because I've gone to University of Georgia Tech uh, on the high voltage utility distribution systems grounding school. So I understand what goes on there. This is not a time for that. What they're trying to do is to say, okay, well, if we can ground it five times a mile on every transfer, every guide wire and at every single building and commercial building, and if we can do it all over the place, what happens is this, when one utility phase goes to ground out of the three phases, what's gonna inherently happen is the other two utility phases are gonna go from, let's say 7,200 volts, they're going to rise. Well, the better the ground connection point that you have, the lower the rise of the other two utility phases in the event of a single utility phase grounding. 
So the utility is trying to provide protection for the customers. The last thing they want to do is have a car accident where one phase goes to ground, the other two phases shoot up high, and it's supposed to be 120, 240, and now they're getting, I don't know, 140, whatever the other number is going to be, 280 or something like that. So that's why they multi-point ground it. Also, multi-point grounding allows, watch this, current leaves its secondary of that substation, goes to the primary, uh, let's say of the pole, make it simple. It then returns back. But in addition to traveling on that neutral conductor back, since it's multi-point grounded, neutral currents will start traveling through the earth. So here on the transform pole, you'll see the primary neutral is connected to the case of the pole. The case of that, I'm sorry, they're connected to the case of the transformer. The case of the transformer is connected to the secondary neutral. You'll see this later on. And then that's all grounded. Well, watch. If neutral current leaves the substation, travels to the primary phase, goes to the winding, and the neutral current returns back over to the utility, that means that the neutral return current can go down all these multipoint grounded systems. It can also get over to the secondary neutral of the winding, and that secondary neutral is required to be brought over to the service equipment enclosure. And with a main bonding jumper, we have to bond that neutral. And now you take the main bonding jumper, you take the grounding electroconductor, you connect it to service equipment. And now guess what happens? Neutral current leaves a transformer. It returns back on the neutral conductor. Every single conductive point that there is, neutral current is going to travel on that. Why does the utility do that? Then you got to go on the internet, do more and more searching about a multi-point grounded system. That's number one. That's how the currents flow. Now, let's take a look at a primary distribution. Here's an overhead transformer. You have current leaving the phase. There's a connection, goes over here. This is a lightning arrestor. You follow the current. Travels along here, gets into a single bushing transformer. By the way, what I'm going to talk about is not applicable in California because they have two bushing transformers for single phase, not single bushing. So you hear phase current comes in, it goes into the primary winding, and then inside that winding, this is the neutral of the secondary, that neutral current returns back. That's how it works. But this neutral point where this is returning on the, on the, on the primary side here is connected to the neutral of the secondary. So your neutral conductor coming in here, it's coming down here, goes to the meter block. It goes over the service disconnect, gets to the main, to the, to the ground, you know, to your, to your grounded terminal. And then it gets main bonding jumper. And then it travels down the grounding electroconductor. It returns back over to the earth. But since you have to have an inner system bonding termination, right? 250.94. And you're going to connect the cable to it. And you're going to connect the telephone to it. Well, telephone company, cable company connects to it. Well, then the neutral current travels on the sheath of the cable and on the sheath of the phone, and it travels all the way back because you might not know this, the cable company also connects to the primary neutral on their sheath of their cable. And the telephone company connects it to it. So take a look at that. Current leaves, goes to the primary side, neutral current returns, but there's alternative paths. Neutral current travels to the grounding electric conductor, to the sheath of the telephone, the cable, it also goes over to the ground at that pole and neutral return current is going to the guide wire. So I'm showing the purple to reflect currents that's not necessarily traveling on the neutral conductor, that are not traveling neutral conductor, just to make it simple. That's overhead. Let's talk about underground. Well, electrons coming down, traveling along the primary conductor. Here's the lightning arrestor, which we don't get involved with. Goes to the single bushing transformer. The primary neutral current returns on the neutral conductor and everything is fine. But that primary neutral conductor is connected to the secondary neutral conductor, which is connected to the service equipment enclosure, right? 250.24A. I mean, well, 254 because you got A and C. And then you have the grounding electroconductor and the main bonding jumper in that location. And all the currents are returning, as we described earlier as well as the primary return neutral current is traveling onto the grounding electrode at the transformer, as well as the guide wires. So that's how electrons flow. It's just the way it is. We have nothing to do with this. Um, what do I have here? Let's see, that one was, oh, okay. I'm gonna repeat it. Underground, okay, well, 
neutral. Let's see, phase current comes in here, it goes down here, it goes to the winding, it returns back on the neutral. The neutral's connected over here to the secondary. So the second neutral conductor comes in, goes to the meter can, goes over the surface disk in the enclosure, main bonding jumper, grounding electric conductor, returns back on the earth, goes over to the grounding bar for, what do we have here? Oh, here's the inner system bonding termination, going to the grounding block for the cable, going over into the telephone, inner system uh, primary protector, and the sheath of both those cables, currents returning back. That's when it works. And we can take a look at it again. This is the service lateral. So that's how currents travel. Now, here's some questions that came up. Why are parallel neutral paths on premises wiring connecting neutrals and equipment grounding conductor not at the main bonding jumper, if that's a standard for utility? The, but the person is asking, hey, Mike, you know, you, can, you are required to bond the neutral. And let me see if I can zoom in on here. You're required to install that main bonding jumper here, but you can't do it after, right? 250.24A5 says you can only do it at this one location, at service equipment, in this particular case, because we're talking about services, but you can't do it on load side. Well, how come we can't do it on the load side, but yet the utility is able to multi-point ground? Well, listen, come on, think about this. Utility is the National Electric Safety Code. They have a totally different voltage system, different configuration system. It's outside of a building. It's not where it, it that's their style. We can't say, well, they can do it. We can do it. <laughs> it's, they have nothing to do with each other. Okay. 250.6 says you can't have equipment grounding and bonding conductors carrying objectionable current, which means you can't bond in more than one location. Um, 250.24, A5 says that it can't be on the load side. It has to be, uh, you know, it, so there's a lot of rules. 250.42A talks about it. So listen, you make a neutral bond connection. We use a single point ground on premises wiring. Utility uses a multi-point ground, just the way it works, okay? Why if I touch the grounding electrode conductor and create another path through the body, in other words, you go out to this location right here and you touch, let me do this here, and you touch this grounding electrode conductor and you're standing on the dirt. Well, think about this. If the primary neutral current is returning with all these alternative paths, if you happen to touch this grounding electrode conductor and you're standing on the earth, is electrons going to travel through you? In other words, are you going to have primary neutral current? Yeah. So that is a fact. Okay. Well, why if I touch the grounding electric conductor and create another path, because you are going to be in, in parallel with the other ones, I don't feel the primary neutral current. Well, you're in parallel with other loads. You're not in series. Your resistance is so high there's a given amount of voltage. If you take a, a 120 volt circuit and you touch the neutral bar of a 120 volt circuit and the neutral bus of a panel board is carrying neutral current, you're not going to get shocked because you're touching a very small amount of voltage. You're not in series with the circuit. You're going to be in parallel with the conductor. So if you don't understand it, I, I'm sorry, it's not a theory class I can explain to you, but I'll try to see if we can do it a little better later on. But also voltage is a factor and maybe that would be, oh, okay, now I understand Mike. So, so the point is, no, you will not get shocked by touching the grounding electric conductor and standing on the earth. Let me phrase that. I can't say you won't get shocked. You might feel it, but you're not, you're not going to, well, you're not going to get killed. We'll talk more about that. Question. Do I need a load on the premises to produce primary neutral current flow? Well, if we look at the graphic, there's no meter in any of these illustrations we've had. There's not even a meter in, out here. The meter is irrelevant. We're not talking about a load. We're talking about there is a conductive return path to the primary neutral returning on the neutral conductor. All the connections that are made to the earth are going to have current. So no, you don't need to have any kind of loading on premises to have primary neutral current. I have gotten calls of people where they had water pipe, where there was a connection on the primary neutral conductor to one water pipe connection, but there was another connection somewhere else. I can't remember how it was, which means all that primary neutral current was traveling through the metal water piping in a house, creating all kinds of high electromagnetic fields. And sometimes people are pretty concerned about that. So back on here. You're not going to feel it, 
Okay, you might feel, okay, all right, fine. You're going to feel it. <laughs> and I'll show you the scenarios when you're going to feel it. But a lot of times you won't. Do I need to have a load on the premises? No, it has nothing to do with the load. Meter's not even in. Okay, let's understand now. That was just trying to explain to you what the facts are, how currents flow on the primary neutral on a single bushing transformer, which is the way it is, but not in California because they use two bushing transformers. Why don't they use a single bushing transformer in California? I don't know. I, I don't know the utility systems why they do that. California. Does that help? All right. Let's take a look at this illustration. Current leads a substation at, I don't know, what voltage is going to be. 69,000 or something like that. No, this would be 70. Yeah, it'll be 7,200 volts, let's just say. Electrons leave. They go out, right? And then they come back. But watch what happens. This is a multi-point ground and neutral system. So as the currents return this way, guess what the currents are going to travel this way? They're going to travel this way. They're going to travel this way. Again, I said, you need to understand fundamentals, which means you know what voltage drop is. You understand voltage drop. You know what E is equal to I times R. E is electromotive force measured in volts times I, which is the intensity measured in amperes times the resistance, which is just resistance measured in... Make it simple, guys, okay? We're not going to get impedance. Let's just make it simple. Measured in ohms, okay? So we're just going to stick with resistance. Now watch. If you understand theory, you know that if you have current leaving and current returning, and it's returning on a path, the path is going to have resistance, or an AC circuit is going to have impedance. And so therefore, if you have current, which is I, and you have opposition of current flow, which is resistance or for alternate current, it's going to be impedance. You're going to get E. If that is true, let me just use an example. That the voltage drop from this point here to the first pole, let's just say, is 0.2 volts. And the voltage drop between pole 1 and pole 2, because it's carrying so many amps, it's carrying, it has so much impedance or resistance, it's 0.2 volts. It's just the voltage drop between those two points. And let's say you go from pole two to pole three, and it's going to be 0.2 volts. And let's just say it was linear, which of course it's not. That means basically the further you get away from the substation, you're going to have voltage drop of each of those segments. And if you measure that voltage from segment one to what is called remote earth, I don't have a point describing here, but that should show here that would be remote earth. Then let's just say, well, if you have two tenths of a volt drop to here, well then from this point here to use into this point here, it's gonna be two tenths. Watch this. Because this substation secondary is going to be grounded to the earth, we've established that the earth itself theoretically has zero volts. So I can go to the first pole and you can see these lines going down to our pole and it's gonna be 0.2 volts because that's what it was. But when I get to the second pole from that point, to the earth, the voltage drop from pole two to pole one, from pole one to zero point is going to be 0.4 volts. So this is called neutral to earth voltage. Really important you understand it's like, well, th no, this is not just technical stuff. This is important. So now, but it's, just, it's a property of what? Now, what, what is that number? How does it change? Okay, first of all, depending upon, if you know E is equal to I times R, if you increase the I, does the utility load increase in the mornings, in the afternoons, in the, after, in the summertime, in the wintertime, in the evening time? So the loads of utility, just like the loads in a house, are going to be changing. And as you start changing the loads from 4 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the evening, as you start changing the loads, look at the formula. That means that the voltage drop, or basically NEV, is a function of the intensity, the amperes, times the resistance. So if you took that voltmeter, and we showed this at 0.6 right now, and you left it there, and you put a recording meter on that, I don't know how high it's going to go, and I don't know how low it's going to go, but it's not going to stay 0.6, because it only stays 0.6 with a given amount of impedance, with a given amount of current, and the current is always changing. Let's talk about the resistance, or that opposition return current, because see, NEV voltage E is equal to I times R. Well, if you got a neutral conductor, which kind of you can kind of predict what that resistance is to some level. But if it's cold, it's going to be a lot more conductive. 
Okay, and if it's going to be hot, it's going to be a little less conductive. Because that's just a property temperature coefficient, positive temperature coefficient of how conductors' conductivity is going to be. Um, did it rain? Because this is a multi-point ground that neutral system, right? Does it rain? Has it been a drought? So you can see, is it, is it frozen ground? Because see, when you get water in the ground and you have ground connection to water and it freezes, um, I think pretty much you don't even have a connection at all. So now more current's gonna travel on the new con conductor because we were using the earth as a parallel path, many parallel paths. So when you see NEV values that we're gonna be talking about, it is a point in time what that value is gonna be. All right, so now that we know we had, let's say, NEV of a 0.6 right here, and if I put a transformer here, let's say this is the transformer up on a pole, well then the primary current comes into the primary transformer and then it returns back on the neutral. But guess what? That neutral return current travels on the transformer pole ground. It travels from the primary to the case of the transformer Back to the secondary, the secondary neutral coming over to the premises, the neutral conductor to the main bonding jumper, traveling to the grounding electric conductor and return current right here. And if, if I wanted to, I, I don't know if I need to or not, you have to give me some feedback. I could put a telephone, you know, feed and I could put a coaxial a, a cable, a CATV, right? Cable company. And then if I did that, well then we'd have inter-system bonding termination, probably should do that next graphic. And then you'd have more current Return. That's just the way it works. We talked about that, but watch this. If we were at 0.6 NEV at that location and that primary connects over to the secondary, that means that the metal parts, everything, the metal parts relative to remote earth. Now, this is the second time I use the term remote earth. What you would like for remote earth is this. You want to go to a point in the earth where there is no current traveling through the earth at all. Because see, when you have current traveling, you create a voltage gradient in the earth. So you want to get away from as 50 feet away from every single thing you possibly can. And probably that's not even going to be enough. But let's just say that's a point. So let's just establish that you go somewhere, you make a connection to the dirt. Well, what kind of connection do you make? Well, you can just take a voltmeter and stick it in the dirt. You can go to a um, not a driveway, because driveways are not going to be very conductive, but you can take a concrete slab and you can just stick it right onto a concrete deck. You can take a little clip on the end of your uh, voltmeter and then you know clip it onto a blade of grass, real cute little plump one, you can do that. You can take it and wrap the end of a voltmeter with an extension of a wire and put it on a screwdriver and stick it in the dirt. It doesn't really, it's not sophisticated because we're not carrying a lot of current. We're carrying insignificant amount of current because these are going to be very high impedance voltmeters. And Brian is going to talk about voltmeters. Brian, I don't know if you have a meter with you, but we'll talk about it later on. So now, just take a voltmeter. Watch this. The main breaker's off. Right now, if you go to your home or any piece of property anywhere, and you take a voltmeter, the proper kind, and Brian's going to explain it to you, and then you just go to the dirt, you are going to measure the NEV. Now watch this. If you happen to be pretty close to utility, your NEV might be 0.2. And if you get further away, it might be 0.4. If you get further away, it might be 0.6. And, 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 it, and it could be a lot more than that. There's no number that relevant. It's just that that is a property. And you're like, okay, so that's kind of weird. I take a voltmeter and I touch metal parts and I connect to the earth and I'm gonna measure the primary neutral NEV. Yes. Now watch this. All these metal parts are all connected together conductively using the effective ground fault current path, right? Article 100 defines what that is. And the effective ground fault current path um, would have the neutral from the utility, uh, would have you know the neutral conductor coming to the service equipment. The main bonding jumper establishes that, and then you'd have an equipment grounding conductor. So all these things are all bonded together. And because they're all bonded together, completely and they're connected to the primary neutral, then on my example using 0.6, then it's 0.6. So I think it'd be kind of cool if you go out to your premises and start checking your NEV. All right, Brian, you want to show a video about NEV, how they can measure it themselves, they can see what we've done? Okay, we're going to be using a voltmeter. This happens to be a Sperry Digital Meter 6400. And a couple of minutes ago, before this recording, we were actually doing a recording and we couldn't figure out what it was. 
what it was is I had it set to two volts. But if you notice here, it was two volts DC. So we couldn't figure out what was going on. So be very careful. If you notice when you set the meter to voltage, I'm gonna set this to two volts AC, and I'm gonna be measuring the neutral to earth voltage to a specific point. And the point I'm gonna use is just a screwdriver connected with a wire. It doesn't matter what the resistance of the wire is. About six feet away from the electrical service. What I'm measuring is the utility has a primary neutral conductor and its primary neutral voltage drop because of primary neutral current and impedance. That primary neutral voltage is going to be making the connection to the secondary neutral conductor. The secondary neutral conductor terminates the service disconnecting means. The service disconnecting means connects to all the electric equipment, which means that when I go from this point in the earth to that enclosure, that means all the electric equipment here that is connected together will have the exact same voltage. And it's gonna be pretty small, usually less than two, but if it's more than two, then you have to change your range. So let's just go to the service disconnect. That's about 2.215. Let me see if I can change this. All right, I wanna set it to two digits. Let's see if I can do the next range here. And I'm gonna go with two digits. So I'm setting it to the 20 volt range that allows me to have just two digits display. So it's about 2.2 volts. This is from that point to the, this location to the primary neutral is 0.2. Um, go to my equipment grounding conductor, of course that's connected, 0.2. And I can check all the equipment. Uh, even though we've checked the resistance, you know, we can go ahead and check the NEV. If it's not 0.2 or very close to that, and you're a homeowner, you want to check it, just have this enclosure covered, and then just go to an enclosure and say, hey, what's the NEV on that? It's 0.2, that's good. What's the NV here? Gotta get to something connection inside here. Yeah, well, can't do that one. Can't get to the enclosure outside. 0 0.2. 0 0.2, that means it's connected. Effective ground fault current path. 0 0.2 here, I can go over to the pump motor. Now we've already checked the uh, effective ground fault path resistance, so we don't have to do it again, but this gives us a double check. This is the bond wire. I want to verify the bonding is there. It's 0.2. Let's see if that motor is connected to it. That's about 0.26. It's getting a little higher now as the load is picking up on the community. Um, let me get this bond wire over here. That should be 0.2. I'll go to the heat pump. One way to verify without opening up any equipment, without using anything, is just verify that there's, an, there's continuity to it. 0.24. Okay, we're not going to watch the rest of that video because that's another topic. We're going to talk about how to use that. So that is the concept of NEV. And we're going to be talking about how we can utilize that, particularly in marinas, RVs, pools, and what have you. All right, Brian, um, what do we have questions coming up to the part just about NEV and how you measure uh, it? Looks like we've got a good one here. Uh, Pete says, hey, Mike, it looks like NEV voltage increases the further you get away from the substation. Is that correct? Okay, if we take a look at the graphic here, if voltage, which is going to be voltage drop, see, we're, all we're doing is when we go from this point to the electrical system to the earth, and as we get further away, we're just measuring the voltage drop of the primary neutral that's in parallel, conducted, it's in parallel with the earth, okay? So if the voltage drop is a function of I times R, the intensity, times the resistance, well, longer you go, what happens? Greater resistance, and as you go, but as you go further away, you have less of a load. Let's see if I can explain that. So if you have a load on, let's go back here. If you have a load on pole one, let's say, a, I don't even know what numbers is. Let me just say 10 amps and a load on pole two of 10 amps and a load on pole three, pole three of three of 10 amps. Well, then this wire right here is only carrying 10 amps. Okay. This wire portion right here is carrying 20 amps and this wire right here is carrying 30 amps. So you have greater distance, but as you get further out, the loads go down. But no matter what happens, NEV will be increasing as you get further away. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Who cares? It doesn't matter if you happen to be at pole three and it's 0.6 or it's two volts or it's five volts or if it's one volt at some other location. So 
conception is what we're talking about here. Don't get involved in the details. Is that like, well, but yes, we, you should understand further away, it's going to get higher. I mean, if you are in the Virgin Islands and your WAPA has the power of one location, you got to go seven miles all the way to the other end of the island. Well, yeah, the NAB is going to be higher at the other end than it's going to be at the substation. All right, here's some other questions. Does NAB exist on a building completely off grid? Nothing tied to the city. No electric cable or phone. Guys, remember, NEV is measuring the voltage drop of the utility neutral return path. So if you have a standalone system, well, then, of course, you can't have NEV. Can NEV be measured with the main breaker on? Remember I showed you the meter cans were all, there was no neutrals? I mean, there were no, no meter in, uh, meters installed. And then whenever I show a disconnect, I showed specifically an example where the disconnect was open and there was no load. If you have the main breaker off, or if you have the meter out of the premises, you will be measuring the NEV of the utility at that given point. If you turn loads on in the premises that you're measuring, let's say the NEV was 0.6. Let's say you happen to be X distance away. The main breaker's off, it's 0 0.6. You turn on the main breaker and you have dryers on and microwaves and dishwashers and disposals and a pool pump and an irrigation motor, and you have 40 or 50 amps on now the secondary on that premises, that's gonna cause a greater amount of primary current on that transformer and it will elevate the NEV. So let's say it was 0.6, main breaker off, turn main breaker on, it goes up to 0.85. Who cares? So yes, for a fact, because by the way, when you go to the earth, you measure point, it's never gonna be zero reference and it doesn't really matter. We're talking about, can we measure something? If we can measure something, then we can use that. So turn the main breaker on, turn the main breaker off. It doesn't really matter what it is. Be two miles from the substation, eight miles of substation, doesn't matter what it is. You have a primary neutral coming, connected to a secondary neutral, connected to the equipment. Everything has an effective ground fault current path. Take a voltmeter from any metal part of the electrical system to the earth, and it will not be zero unless the utilities lost power. And there's a comment. Hey, had one at a pole below a transformer that measured 5.41 volts from the ground wire to the earth. Is that a problem? And this is a real fair question asking is like, well, number one, you're never going to find remote earth. Okay. So you will never actually truly measure the NEV. That's the real NEV. Two, you turn loads on and off. It's going to change. Three, the utility loads are going on or up. They're going to change. And now what is considered safe? Remember we talked about the NEV is equal to E is equal to I times R. Utilities have cables sometimes and they have failures. They'll have what is called a, a concentric neutral underground cable where they'll have like copper conductors wrapped braided around the outside. Well, that braided copper conductor is the neutral. Well, it's exposed to the elements of the soil. It gets dissolved. It gets decomposed. It gets removed. And all of a sudden, NEB is going to rise. What's considered a reasonable number? I say three volts is good. Well, Mike, what if it was five? Oh, well, then it's, then it's five volts. Well, Mike, what about it's eight? Oh, well, then it's eight. Well, in other words, there's nothing you can say to anybody that it's too high because this is a utility distribution system. If it starts getting five volts, well, you might be in an old utility distribution system and you're kind of far away. And it happens to be 5.41. What's the max permissible NEV for utility system? There is none. I have heard, I've gotten phone calls from people that had as high as 19. Now that will kill you in certain circumstances. And so I had the customer, oh, the customer, I had a gentleman who called me, go check all the power lines. And when he checked the NEV along all the power lines, it was like, I don't know, we'll say whatever it was, a one, two, you know, right? One, two, three, four, five, it should be going up down the line. It went like one, 1.5 to 12. Well, you know what that means? <laughs> There's a problem between that pole and this pole with what? The primary neutral conductor. It's damaged, it deteriorated, uh, the, the, the splicing connection points are, are corroding. So you can take an infrared, if you can shoot it up there and hit it, you'll find out it's a lot hotter than everything else because it's, a, it's corrosion. Electricians, you know that, it's, it, it'll heat up. It creates a bigger voltage drop. So. 
If it goes up about three or four volts, not that it's really a problem in some situations, which we'll talk about when we talk about, well, how do you use this information and how do you know when it's maybe not safe? And how can you, that's gonna be the next program we talk about. Right here, how to use NEB to ensure that electrical systems are safe. Now that's a totally different video. We're talking about how can you make sure if you went to an RV park that all the pedestals are connected to an equipment grounding conductor? How can you make sure the RV is safe? How can you make sure that the, swim, the pole that the young boy is going to touch? How can you go to a ball field with all these huge poles? How can you take a voltmeter there? And how could you make sure that, no, hey, you know what? That's connected to an equipment grounding conductor. What about in marinas? How can you make sure that the, the, the prop on, on, a, on a boat is not energized at 120 volts? How do you know that, that the disconnect means is, is connected to an equipment grounding conductor? How do you know in a swimming pool? How can you go out there and safely, confidently go back and say, listen, I can take care of this. I, I can go to a ball field. I'm going to give you the tools to be measuring that. Uh, I can take you over to, what was the first one? Uh, the RV, how to make it safe. Uh, swimming pools. And the last one was well, marinas. And that is a different video. So what you really need to do, if we don't have any other further questions, is go back and watch this video again to understand the concept. And if you don't understand the concepts, then maybe you don't have enough fundamental electrical background to understand it. So that's the end of this video. So Brian, if you want to go ahead and, and close up the, uh, close this a close up video, unless we have any questions, and then we're going to do the next video right now. And that video is how to use NEB to ensure electrical systems are safe. We have a couple questions before you dodge out of here. Um, I've got okay. uh, one from Danny Baker, and he says, does inductive voltage affect NEV voltage? There is no such thing as inductive voltage. So that's just a, a term. I mean, anytime you get a wire carrying current, it creates electromagnetic field. And I don't know of anything that you could induce that would ever do anything other than make a transformer. So no, you're, there is no inductive voltage okay. scenario that anybody can think of. You can't say, well, you know, I put a voltmeter on that. Here's, here's an example, inductive voltage. Brian, I know you know about this one. You're on a lift and you're working at a parking lot and there is a metal pole and you're right below a high voltage transmission line. Well, guess what? You're gonna have induced capacitive charge on the pole. Brian, are you familiar with what I'm talking about there? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, but that has nothing to do with no. NEV. NEV is a function, just like I showed you, to watch it all over again and don't start thinking anything else. So inductive voltage would be like, yeah, you get nailed when you touch the pole. Why? Well, it's not related to anything. Right, right. What else? Okay, uh, I got one from Pete here. Hey, Mike, if I put an amp meter on the uh, number four bare copper conductor, <laughs> At the utility pole, would I read amperage? It sounds like neutral current returns underground from the utility pole also. Brian, actually, I tasked him to go out to a power line to measure the power line. And Brian, what, are the, what is the answer to that? Uh, the answer is yes. You definitely can have that for sure. As a matter of fact, I had uh, four tenths of an amp on one of the poles that I measured. Exactly right. So the answer is yes, of course you can measure that but it doesn't really matter because the current is whatever the current's going to be right 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 so that's just way how it's going to go and all right what's the next question let's see here had a comment from research and research mm -hmm. just wanted to clarify clarify for the guys that are familiar with distribution systems that are listening that in some areas okay. they don't run an actual primary neutral. They use the secondary neutral and make a connection at the beginning of the run. So voltage drop probably plays an even bigger, uh, has an even bigger play there, I would imagine. I don't understand what research is saying. Uh, now, they, they, there, have, there are utility systems. I'm actually, I'm not even gonna okay. go there but because we're talking about primary NEV and uh, yeah, I don't want to mess it up. We got enough problems to understand that. I think All we're right. good. I think that wraps Are we us done up. With that?